afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce for third year in a row uh, the winners of the ESRB Research Prize. As the introductor has uh, mentioned, this uh, is an annual prize that was established in 2014, first awarded in 2015, in the memory of Ieke van der Boe, a long-standing member of European Parliament that was also a member of the first ASC at the ESRB, the first advisory scientific committee. As a, as a Euro parliamentary, she was also defending the idea of having something like an advisory scientific committee in an institution like this. The ASC runs uh, this prize in collaboration with the ESRB secretariat, uh, reading and uh, assessing the papers submitted in response to an open call. So those of you who have contact with uh, young scholars producing research in the field of macro pro, you should encourage them to, to be aware of the next call, which will come in a few months' time. Um, the idea is to award the prize to young scholars, uh, young in the broad sense, under the age of 35, if I'm not wrong, uh, with an outstanding research paper on one topic or several topics related to the ESRB mission. This year, the ASC was confronted with a difficult uh, choice. The papers were very good. We have uh, plenty of uh, good papers in the short list. So we deliberated. Uh, we had a couple of voting uh, rounds with a tie. So eventually, the ASC decided to award uh, the prize ex equo to two winners. So you will not see one winner today, but two winners. So we will have to compress the presentations in the remaining of the time to see, to see each of the winners. These two papers actually share been excellent pieces of empirical research on topics that, as you will discover, are clearly connected to macroprudential uh, discussions. And in each paper, you will find an element of uh, great originality. So I'm not going to reveal my own wording of what that element of big originality is, but you will discover in the presentation of the solo authors who are uh, winning uh, this uh, prize uh, this year. So without uh, further delay, I'm going to proceed to announce the names of the, of the winners. I'm going to do it in a strict alphabetical order because there will be a first and a second, but this doesn't mean that we are ranking the uh, winners. This is ex equo. Um, and a novelty this year is that uh, there is a small object that uh, is going to symbolize the prize, and I'm going to also deliver to the winner. So let me say who the first winner is in alphabetical order. This is André. Silva, I think a Portuguese national, currently an economist at the Division of Research and Statistics of the Federal Reserve Board, and he's a winner for the submitted paper that is called a Strategic Liquidity Mismatch and Financial Sector Stability, a paper that is now being accepted for a publication in the review of financial studies. So Andres, please come to the podium and I will give this prize to you with great pleasure. <laughs> Our uh, second winner, again in alphabetical order, is Guillaume Bilmé, uh, currently an associate professor of finance at ASC uh, Paris. And his submitted paper actually had a longer title than it has, so I'm going to announce the current title of the winning paper, which is the value of central clearing. This paper is, and I think this sounds that the, the committee has good taste, is now accepted for publication at the Journal of Finance. Guillaume, please come to the, to the stage. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please take, take your seat. Okay, so now I think that the rest of the time is for the winners to show their achievements in these uh, very good papers.
so let's start. Uh, let's just start with Andre. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank the ESRB, Javier, and the rest of the scientific committee for the invitation to be here today. It's a great honor uh, to receive this award and, and, and to be part of, of this conference. So this, this was my uh, job market paper at, of my PhD at Cass Business School in London, but because I'm now uh, at the Federal Reserve Board, the usual disclaimer applies. So everything I will say uh, here are my own views and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve. Okay, so let me start by giving you some motivation into this paper. So as we know, since at least the seminal work by Diamond and Big Vig, banks have a unique ability to create liquidity by financing uh, illiquid, or if you want, long maturity assets such as corporate loans with liquid, or if you want, short-term uh, liabilities such as demand deposits. And crucially, this combination uh, of lending on one side of the balance sheet and deposit taking on the other allows banks to protect firms and households against both idiosyncratic and systematic liquidity shocks. And there is also plenty of evidence showing that it also helps promoting uh, economic growth. However, there are always two sides of the same coin. And the bad news here is that due to their fundamental liquidity provision role, uh, banks are also intrinsically fragile. So as the financial crisis a decade ago clearly shows, excessive liquidity mismatch can lead to bank runs, the breakdown of funds in all sales markets, as well as distressed asset sales that threaten not only the solvency of individual banks, but the financial system more broadly. Now we kind of knew all these before the crisis, what is new and one of the main insights that came after the crisis from the theoretical literature in economics and finance on this issue is that this relationship between excessive liquid transformation activity and financial instability can be further exacerbated when banks collectively as a group engage in strategic risk-taking behavior in the form of common portfolio choices, okay? So I think it's important to take a step back here and try to understand, well, why would banks have an incentive to engage in collective risk taking in the first place. And there are at least three very reasonable explanations uh, to why this might be the case. The first are bailout uh, guarantees, in which a bank might have an incentive to take on more risk. So for instance, by financing uh, more and more uh, uh, long maturity, um, for instance, corporate loans with more and more short term liabilities, if it observes <laughs> if, it, if this bank uh, obs observes that their competitors are doing exactly the same thing. And why is that? Because if there is a shock and one bank gets into trouble, well, probably all the other banks will get into trouble as well uh, because they were doing exactly the same type of uh, risky activities. So the lender of last resort will have no alternative than bailing them out, bailing them out altogether in case of generalized distress. So this is the classical too many to fail uh, story. This collective risk taking can also be explained uh, by contractual features in the compensation of bank managers. In fact, as two recent theoretical papers show, relying on relative performance valuation in compensation packages uh, incentivizes banks to choose investments that are increasingly correlated with their peers, uh, thereby uh, uh, increasing systemic risk. And importantly, uh, while public, public guarantees would magnify this mechanism, uh, RPE and associated correlated portfolio choices can still generate systemic risk, even in the absence of a lender of large resort, okay? And finally, this, this collective risk-taking behavior can be driven simply by learning, or if you want free riding in information acquisition in which a bank, particularly if it's small, might mimic those that it thinks that have greater expertise. So if this channel is at play, we, we would observe at least in principle, small banks mimicking large banks, but not vice versa. It would not make too much sense. The key point I wanna make here is that despite this extensive theoretical literature on this issue, these collective risk-taking strategies among banks have not been yet empirically tested uh, in a convincing manner. So, and in case I lose you towards the middle of the presentation, this is the main thing I want you to take home. So in this paper, what I do is to show empirically that first of all, commercial banks strategically incorporate their competitor, the competitor's liquidity mismatch policies when determining their own, 
And second, that these collective uh, uh, risk-taking decisions have a negative impact on financial sector stability, okay? Why is this important? Given where I am, I don't think I need to spend too much time on this, but let me just state it for the record. So commonality in portfolio exposures, as well as a reasonable high levels of liquid transformation activity, obviously increases the likelihood that banks fail altogether, which ultimately can sow the seeds for costly crisis, as we all uh, know. And this issue is particularly relevant uh, after the crisis, with both academics and policymakers questioning the, the efficacy of, of recent uh, liquidity regulation reforms. So Javier has done some work on this. The ESRB is talking about this issue since at least 2014. The, the ECB has published a report in October last year, the ECB Task Force on Systemic Liquidity, that again talks about these issues and the importance of regulating liquidity risk from a macroprudential uh, perspective. Okay, so before I tell you in a bit more detail the results in this paper, I think it's important to explain you why it's so difficult to identify these peer effects in, in, uh, uh, from an empirical uh, perspective. And here, just consider a simple uh, linear in means model in which the liquidity transformation activity of a given domestic bank I that operates in country J time T is modeled as a function of the average liquidity transformation activity of its, of its peers, of its competitors in the same country, as well as a bunch of controls, okay? And here, the peer effects of interest will be captured by the coefficient beta, basically, that basically captures the influence of competitors' liquidity mismatch positions on those of bank I. So there are at least two uh, well-known uh, issues, endogeneity issues, that, that one should bear in mind. The most famous one, the most, the most uh, important one, perhaps, would be that the strategic reactions are intrinsically simultaneous. So this is a classical reflection problem of Charles Musky, and here it's very simple to understand. If the liquidity mismatch position of NK is affected by that of its competitors, then the liquidity mismatch position of its competitor is also affected by that of NK. Okay? Uh, and the problem here, so in other words, is that each bank affects and is affected by all the other banks in the system, so one cannot disentangle if bank I's decision is the cause or the effect of its peers' uh, choices. The other potential issue is uh, correlated, or if you want, common group effects in which banks in the same local network, in the same peer group, are subject to common but unobserved shocks for the researcher that lead them to choose similar policies, okay? So, so here we could observe similar behavior among banks, not because of any type of strategic behavior, but simply because they were subject to similar shocks. So, due to the absence of uh, an experiment or even a quasi-natural experiment that I could exploit in this setting, I instead use a so-called instrumental variables approach. So basically, uh, a variable that induces variation in the endogenous variable of interest, so the liquidity mismatch position of peer banks, but that does not affect directly the outcome variable, so the liquidity mismatch position of bank I. So in a bit more detail, what I do is to explore systematic differences in peer group composition. So different peer groups for different banks uh, in, in the sample operating in the same country. And having this structure of connections with partially overlapping peer groups allows me to use the liquidity mismatch position of a peer's peer as an instrument, as an IV. The question here is how? So how do banks of similar size and similar business model operating in the same country um, uh, have different, uh, di different peer groups. So the key feature I exploit is that large cross-border banking groups tend to manage liquidity on a global scale, as well as coordinate their risk management policies within the group. So it might be reasonable to assume, and that this is exactly what I do in this paper, that in addition to the liquidity choices of its direct competitors that operate in the same country, a foreign home subsidiary also takes into consideration the overall liquidity mismatch position of its bank holding group when determining their own. So, and this bank holding group operates in a completely different uh, country. Let me give you just very quickly this example just to illustrate. So here, all these banks they have similar size, similar business model, they all operate in the same country. The only difference between them is that Bank A uh, is a foreign home subsidiary. And the, the bank C1, C2, C3, and C4 are the competitors of bank A that are purely domestic banks. So now we introduce this bank X, this bank holding company that is based in a different country but that owns the foreign home subsidiary A. And now you start seeing this, this 
this structure of connections with partially overlapping peer groups. Why is that? Because any domestic bank here, so for instance, bank C1 only has four peers, which are, the, which are the banks that are operating in the same country, while a foreign home subsidiary, the, the bank A, has both the, the four peers, so the four banks that operate in the same country, but also considers the liquidity mismatch positions of its bank holding group that is based abroad, okay? So what this means in practice is basically that one can use this liquidity mismatch position of the bank holding group, the bank X, that is based in a different country, as an instrument for, for the liquidity mismatch position of the peers of bank C1, C2, C3, and C4. Okay, the identifying assumption here is simply that a, a, a domestic bank, so for instance bank C1, should have little incentive to mimic directly the liquidity policies of a bank holding group that is based on another country. And in this setting, this seems to be a plausible assumption. So going back to the three main explanations that I gave you in the very beginning of the presentation, so first of all, within country banks have higher incentives to mimic their peers since they share the same lender of last resort. If one thinks about uh, relative performance evaluation, there's also plenty of evidence out there showing that firms select peers quite narrowly, so for instance, other firms in the same country and the industry when setting RPE because the objective is to filter out common shocks to performance, and also learning is also more likely to occur uh, within countries where information for bank, managers, for, for bank managers of small banks is more accessible and where banks share a similar regulatory and economic environment. So in terms of the other characteristics I use to define peer groups, it's, it's a business model implicitly because I only have commercial banks in the sample as well as bank size. So I don't want to waste too much time on this because I try to be as least controversial as possible in terms of the liquidity mismatch indicators I use. So I basically use the three main measures that are out there in the literature. So the Berger and Bauman liquidity creation measure, the liquidity mismatch index, as well as the proxy for the net stable funding ratio, okay? And again, the sample, everything is pretty standard here. So I use both a cross country sample uh, of banks operating in the OECD countries uh, using bank level data from Bankscope and, and uh, an alternative sample more granular, more high frequency uh, from the US that allows me crucially to, to, uh, to capture liquidity created off the balance sheet that for instance in the US accounts for almost half of, of all liquidity created. Okay, so as promised, let me go to the results. So first of all, what this paper shows is that commercial banks follow the liquidity mismatch policies of their respective competitors when determining their own, okay? The economic impact is large and consistent with a coordinated behavior where each bank constantly adjusts to each other's positions, okay? In terms of cross-sectional heterogeneity, what I show in the paper is that these peer effects are concentrated in ex-ante riskier banks that have lower capital ratios, lower profit stability, and lower distance to default, or if you want higher uh, default risk. And I also show in the paper that this collective risk-taking behavior is purely driven by liquidity created uh, on the asset side of the balance sheet, of, of course, where of each uh, lending is a key component. And Finally, in this first part of the results, while the objective of this paper is not to tell you what is driving this collective risk-taking behavior, it's simply to demo, it's to, be able to show you, hopefully in a convincing manner, that this behavior exists and the consequence of it, but I still show that uh, in my setting that small banks only follow other small banks and large banks only follow other large banks. What this means in practice is that uh, learning, or if you want free riding and information acquisition, uh, might not play a, a big role in this setting because as I mentioned in the beginning, if this channel is at play, we would observe small banks be making large banks, but not vice versa. All right, so in the second part of the paper, I show that strategic complementarity in banks' liquidity mismatch decision deteriorates the stability of the financial system. So first of all, to analyze the direction in which these peer effects operate, I first show that the response of individual banks to their peer choices is asymmetric. So mimic only occurs when the competitors are taking, up, are taking on more risk. That really suggests that this behavior is indeed uh, strategic. And then I show explicitly that these peer effects are, are, are associated with statistically and economically significant increases in default risk of individual institutions uh, as well as systemic risk. Okay, so I have 30 seconds left, so let me conclude. So what do I do in this paper? I show that liquidity mismatch choices of competitors do matter 
for liquidity, the, the, the liquidity mismatch decisions of individual banks. I show that this effect is concentrated on the asset side of the balance sheet and is asymmetric. And then in terms of the consequences of all this, I show that the strategic liquidity risk management decisions increase both individual banks' default risk and systemic risk. And in my last 15 seconds, I will just tell you uh, uh, what this means in terms of policy. So first of all, the results, these results clearly highlight the importance of regulating uh, systemic uh, liquidity risk from a macroprudential perspective by, for instance, introducing a time-varying NSFR that, that operates in the contracyclical manner. This is nothing controversial. The ESRB and the ECB already uh, discussed this issue at, at length, and I think this, would, this could be uh, uh, of value. And obviously, and finally, this is my last point, because I run out of time, uh, the move from bailouts to credible bail-ins is, is clearly an important step to mitigate the incentives for collective risk-taking behavior, even if, and allow me uh, the self-advertising, the self-promotion here, even if this is associated with uh, um, short-term but limited negative effects to the real economy, as I show in a follow-up paper, this time a, a co-author paper, uh, exploiting, in this case, a quasi-natural experiment, which corresponds to the failure and subsequent resolution through a bail-in of a major bank in Portugal. This is all for me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, André. Thank you very much also for... <coughs> you, you, you exceeded the time because you were explaining the policy implications, which is important in a house like this. Uh, if we have time at the end, we may come back to, to some of them. Uh, the second you refer to self-promoting uh, <laughs> subsequent job, because actually my, my doubt was that I couldn't see direct evidence for the second argument. But uh, let's proceed with the <laughs> second winner. Um, Guillaume, please, the floor is yours. So, thank you, Javier, and thanks a lot, everyone, for, uh, for, uh, for giving this prize. So you just had a very... Uh, Clever and clever paper. I'm just going to have a very simple story, but I think a very interesting story, which is going to be the following. So, uh, as you know, uh, one of the main reforms following the financial crisis is to make central clearing of derivatives mandatory. In a word, as you know, central clearing is just essentially having CCPs, central clearing counterparties, guaranteeing trades in markets for derivatives. And the story I'm going to tell you is a very interesting story, which is the story of the very first derivatives clearing house in history. And this CCP was created in France in 1882 in the market for coffee futures. And so what I just did is to go to some uh, archives in Le Havre and in many other places and to try to understand why people at the time, without any uh, incentive given by regulators, created these CCPs and what kind of effect it had, in particular, what kind of real effects it had. And I will show you that it had very large impacts. In particular, it changed dramatically the geography of trade flows throughout Europe, and after traders in, the, in coffee in Le Havre could hedge futures or could hedge inventories without counterparty risk, a lot more of the coffee trade throughout Europe was going through Le Havre, and Le Havre became a much bigger harbor before Within a few years, central clearing could, could spread uh, throughout Europe. Okay, so I'm just going to um, tell you essentially the, the story in a, in a second. So, of course, what you should have in mind here is uh, all this region of the north of Europe, what the people in geography call the northern range, you know, with a lot of large harbors at the time, London, Liverpool, Le Havre, Antwerp, Rotterdam, Hamburg, all of these are large harbors at the time. It's actually the most active trade area worldwide at the time. Free trade is quite general. Uh, Steamboats are replacing sailboats. So trade is booming. And the key feature of the coffee market, which I'm studying, which is very important, is the following. Is that at the time, a very large part of the coffee in the world is produced in one country, which is Brazil. And so it all comes within a few weeks during the year. So you need dealers to hold large inventories of coffee for the full year and to cater slowly to consumption for one year. And so, of course, as any dealer uh, in the market that has to hold big inventories, those inventories are exposed to some price risk, and so there is some demand for hedging those inventories. Okay? And so what had happened for centuries is that you have had forwards and then futures that people were using to hedge those inventories. And the key thing is that before 
these events before CCPs, how people were trading those forwards or those futures. Typically, there was very little collateral. So how could I trust Javier or André if I enter a future with them? Well, typically, Javier would be in a family which would have been in the coffee business for one century. So his name would be very well known in some harbor. And so I would know that most likely he's not going to bust tomorrow because he has been around for many, many years, many decades, sometimes several centuries. And so uh, reputation was a substitute for collateral. There was very little collateral. And so what happens, and which gave rise to central clearing, is that in 1880, there is a very big crisis worldwide, starting in the US and spreading through Europe. And several of the main dealers in the US fail very, almost simultaneously within a few weeks. And so all this system based on reputation collapses. Suddenly, I don't know if I can trust Javier anymore uh, because the uh, other big dealers have failed. And so people everywhere start to look for ways to restart trade. And so traders in Le Havre come up with this institution, which would become central clearing counterparties. And what is quite fascinating is that the way it worked at the time is almost exactly the way it works today. So before you had, I had a bilateral contract with Javier. Now we have a CCP becoming the direct counterparty to uh, me and to Javier. This is exactly how it works today. More interestingly, how would the counterparty guarantee or ensure each of us against counterparty risk? It would collect margins, both initial margins and variation margins, exactly as they do today. Okay? And if uh, Javier or me fail on paying a margin call, then the CCP would liquidate the position exactly as they do today. And one difference, if uh, the CCP liquidating Javier's or my position creates a loss, all of the loss would be borne by the equity holders of the CCP. Today, typically, we would have more complex uh, loss sharing mechanisms, the so-called default waterfall. Okay? And so this CCP starts operating so in, uh, in 1882. What is very interesting is that it's a completely private initiative. It's really the traders and, and the dealers in Le Havre uh, coming together at the Chamber of Commerce and coming up with this. There was zero uh, uh, regulatory incentive at the time. And so the key innovation is really this idea that there is one institution that becomes the direct counterparty to both traders of, uh, of coffee futures. Okay, so what I could find is first, uh, so I went to uh, probably 20 different uh, archives, uh, so a lot of institutional data, minutes from a general assembly, uh, a lot of futures market data, so all of the prices every day in this market, some information of the identity of the traders, and most importantly, what I do is that I go to the uh, uh, customs archives of uh, eight or nine European countries, and for each, within each of them, I reconstruct trade flows in coffee and in, ma in many other commodities, uh, harbor by harbor, and with, between pairs of countries. Okay, and I have the following uh, coverage of country, Belgium, France, and so on. Okay. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I don't need to look at this. Uh, what I'm doing is extremely simple. So it's what uh, you know, econometricians call a triple difference in differences. I'm simply comparing how much coffee goes to Le Havre with how much coffee goes to other harbors where there is no central clearing house. And within Le Havre, I'm going to compare coffee, which benefits from this insulation against counterparty risk, with other coffee, like sugar, tea, uh, vanilla, whatever, tobacco, uh, where uh, you don't have any of this uh, central clearing. Okay? And so the control group, uh, which I'm going to use to compare coffee with, is what uh, you see written at the time as colonial commodities. So these are, as I said, sugar, cocoa, and so on. And I will look at trade flows uh, six years before and six years after uh, around this event. Okay? Um, so I start at the within, within France, and I have the data from 22 different customs in France. So most of them are harbors, but not all of them are harbors. Uh, where coffee can enter France. And I'm going to compare, well, how does that change? What is the share of coffee entering France in Le Havre before and after uh, uh, 1882 uh, relative to all other harbors and to all other commodities? And so uh, the basic number to look at is 0 0.111, uh, top left, which is essentially telling you after uh, central clearing comes in place, uh, 
there is an increase by 11 percentage points in the share of all the imp coffee imports of France that comes through Le Havre relative to other harbors. So France imports not more coffee in volume, but a bigger share of it comes through the harbor where now dealers can hedge their inventories without counterparty risk. And what is interesting is that it's not that suddenly people in Le Havre start to drink more coffee, not at all. I actually have statistics on stocks, so they store more coffees, and they actually re-export more of these coffees. So it's not that, it's really that they become a hub for holding inventories, because now they can hedge them without inventory risk. It's not that they uh, uh, consume more coffee. Okay. Then I do, uh, what is interesting uh, is that uh, actually they also introduce it for cotton, so you also have uh, the same results basically for cotton. And then I do the same regression uh, Europe-wide. So uh, I'm going to go there. So I have uh, what, how many? Seven regressions for seven different European countries. And what I'm looking at is exactly the same thing. Uh, what is the share of their coffee imports in Belgium, Germany, and so on that comes from France relative to other countries? And this share again increases significantly after uh, central clearing is in place in France. Okay, so this uh, gives, shows us that we really have real effects in terms of reshuffling completely trade flows uh, throughout Europe. Okay. I also have a lot of narrative evidence that this was going on. And what is perhaps uh, more interesting is that, of course, within a few years, uh, other countries realized that Le Havre was really taking over in terms of the coffee trade. And so they wanted to imitate and to also introduce central clearing. And within a period of 10 years, we have about 10 other harbors in Europe that also introduced central clearing, including Hamburg, which was the main competitor of Le Havre at the time, but many other in other commodities. And actually, it's a very interesting uh, historical period because out of those CCPs, not all of them succeeded. Some failed really quickly. So there is a lot of interesting events in terms of the design of the CCP, which differed across all of these CCPs at the time. Okay. So that's, uh, that's about it. So then I have a number of uh, uh, alternative tests, which I'm not going to show, but which I'm going to discuss very briefly for the time, which is to say, well, what is really the mechanism? What really did the CCP do? And so if I come back to my example with Ravier, the problem is that before, you know, there is reputation. Ravier has reputation. Andre has no reputation. So I want to trade with uh, those who have the best reputation, so I want to trade with Ravier. But then there is a, this crisis, and I don't really know anymore who is a good co quality counterparty, who is a bad quality counterparty. So there is what we could call in economics a pooling equilibrium. Uh, I cannot distinguish anymore who is good and who is bad. And so the argument is what, what the CCP really does is by requiring members to post high margins, and the margin requirements are actually quite high, it will allow us to separate the types, to separate again the good types from the bad types. And only those which, who will have sufficient financial resources to pay those margins will be able to enter the CCP. And from this situation where I cannot distinguish anymore who is good and who is bad, I will be able to separate again only the one with sufficiently many resources will be able to join the CCP and to trade in the CCP. And there is actually a lot of evidence that lower quality counterparties were complaining a lot about those margins because they were finding very hard to continue trading uh, in the market uh, in the market afterwards. Okay. And the last thing I want to show is that uh, another impact, which was probably completely unintended, is that it made markets a lot more competitive. Why is that? Well, before, if I trade only based on reputation, Establishing the reputation of Javier, of having been in the coffee business for one century, takes a lot of time. It takes maybe one century to build. Uh, and of course, if André has not, never been in the coffee business, he will not really be able to enter and to build this reputation, even if he is very good. Now that he just needs to post sufficient margin, he doesn't need any pre-existing reputation to be able to enter the market. He just needs sufficient financial resources to pay the margin cost. And so what we see afterwards is a quite significant entry into the markets of new traders, suggesting that now that uh, 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 trading becomes more anonymous in a sense, just based on margins, uh, entry is actually a lot easier in this, uh, in this market.
Okay. Uh, so just to conclude a bit ahead of time, because we are uh, late, as I understand. Uh, so what I show is essentially that central clearing uh, reshaped uh, trade flows Europe-wide at the time. Uh, so it had very significant uh, real effect. And one of the main mechanisms is because it reduced adverse selection. It mitigated some information problems. It made it easier to separate again uh, good and bad types. That said, uh, most of you are policy makers. I don't think there are any implications, unfortunately, of this for the assessment of current reforms. The main reason is that clearing at the time was voluntary. Now it's mandatory. And so, of course, the incentive structure may be very different. Uh, both are, of course, very interesting to study. Uh, but I don't want to push this uh, too far. I think it's uh, uh, interesting enough like this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume. So I think your, your focus on, on the coffee market uh, is sort of a perfect introduction for our coffee break. <laughs> uh, we, we, were, we were taking a little bit of uh, extra time uh, to start. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to, well, uh, let the, the audience uh, judge uh, on the originality grounds that I was mentioning. That yes, if, if any of you has been sleepy before our coffee, in the first paper, there is this exploitation of the overlap of ownership of group uh, banks and then introduction different domestic markets to create this original instrumental variable for identification of otherwise very tricky to identify network effects that I think was very clear in the presentation. In Guillaume's paper, uh, there is this huge investment in historical sources and this uh, originality bonus in, in trying to look at uh, CCPs uh, of the old days. And, and it's quite amazing to discover the essence of the economics behind is to be so similar uh, to the one that somehow you started mentioning the crisis of, of 1880 and, and uh, the, the, the move into compulsory clearing. Uh, a central clearing was a reaction to another financial crisis. No? When, when the repo and other derivatives market went into crisis, we reacted somehow like the little market in France, well, not so little market in France, reacted at much more innovative uh, historical times. If you, any Maybe I just add something. Yeah. There was a debate in the French parliament on mandatory clearing in 1900. There was a crisis in the wool market, and there is a big report written by the French parliament a century ago, or 120 years ago, uh, discussing mandatory central clearing. Interesting. So it sounds like it didn't go through at the time, but there is at. really a big because, of course, what is what is missing from your from your particular example is is the uh, sort of system-wide motivation. I guess the creators of the CCP were essentially self-interested. And with great success, no? When we uh, in Europe introduced mandatory clearing, the feeling was that the system is, was going to uh, uh, work better. Uh, why the agents were not converging to the private solution by themselves? The answer is the externality. Uh, spillovers and the first paper topic. Unfortunately, no more time for the discussion. <laughs> so thanks again. Thank you very much. You are established a very high bar for the next years. Yeah.